So we've all seen the news of the recent chemical attack in Syria, followed by the United States bombing Syria. But here's the thing. This makes no goddamn sense. And you know it's a conspiracy when it makes no goddamn sense. For example, why would Assad do this? On the eve of peace talks, while he is winning the war, why would he gas his own people, civilians? Not even the rebels fighting him, just randomly gas civilians. Does that make any sense to you? Now they tried to pass this same story back in 2013, but it was found out by the United Nations, MIT, and other credible organizations that the gas attack in 2013 was done by the rebels, CIA funded rebels. So why would, why would Assad do this? This is WMDs all over again. And just the other day, Bolivia gave an amazing speech at the UN about this. Now here's my take on what's going on. A lot of people are making multiple claims, but the obvious conclusion of what's going on is this was likely done as a false flag to get the United States into another war. Who did it? No one knows. Why did they do it? No one knows. That's all assumptions at this point. We may assume it was done by the CIA to get America into, the, into another war. We may assume it was done by the Pentagon on the behalf of defense contractors to get America into another war so they can sell weapons. We can assume it was done by Trump, that Trump ordered it specifically as a way to distract from the ongoing Russian investigations. But all of this is irrelevant. Because it happened. A gas attack happened in Syria. Assad was accused of doing it. And America launched 59 nuclear... Not, not nuclear, sorry. And America launched 59 missiles at Syria. Luckily, not nuclear missiles. But it keeps getting worse. Because recently, Trump recently ordered the US military to the Korean Peninsula. Escalating the situation there. And on the same day that Trump met with the Chinese president, North Korea launched a missile that fell into the sea off of the coast of Japan. So you're seeing where all of this is going. Syria, you're seeing, you're, we still have a war in Ukraine. We, and now we have Trump heading to the Korean Peninsula. And he already said that he would go to war there. And if he goes to war in the Korean Peninsula, then it will go nuclear very quickly. If the US invades North Korea, there is no way I see World War III not starting over this. And here's why. North Korea has nuclear weapons. North Korea is bordering China. If America invades North Korea, then basically the news America is giving to the rest of the world is no matter if you have nuclear weapons, we will invade you. That basically means no country is safe. So all of the years of diplomacy and peace and everything trying to avoid war and trying to avoid conflict basically means nothing if America invades. And it would force Russia and China to respond because they have nukes and if they don't respond then what does that mean america can invade them regardless if they have nuclear weapons now if trump invades north korea then south korea and maybe japan and a few other nearby nations including china may suffer badly most likely definitely in south korea north korea would likely drop a few nukes on South Korea killing millions of people. They might be able to reach Japan again killing millions of people and knocking down other nearby countries. So yeah, North Korea is a major hotspot and we can't afford it to go nuclear but then we have someone like Trump who simply does not care about diplomacy. 
and this may likely happen. So everyone hold on to your seatbelts real tight because it's about to get hot. Back to Syria, if anyone believes Assad had any reason to do that, then you're basically insane. The only people cheering on the missile strikes in Syria are ISIS, Hillary Clinton, all of the neoliberals, all of the neoconservatives, people like John McCain, although we have a few sane people like Ron Paul who are against it, thankfully because of his libertarian views. And we have a few smart people. Shockingly, Paul Joseph Watson came out against Trump. It's not insane. It is an unholy alliance when me and Paul Joseph Watson agrees on something. When the left and Paul Joseph Watson agrees on anything. Same thing with Sargon of Akkad. I've been trying to reach out to him about this topic. This is one thing that, and I don't want to sound cheeky or cheesy, but this is one thing that all sides of the political spectrum, outside of the establishment groups, can agree on that taking out Assad is a bad idea. He's a secular government and he's maintaining stability in the region and I don't believe any of the propaganda people have against him. Any of the propaganda the West has, I don't believe anything the West says or, or the West or Western media or any of those stuff there because they're all lying. They lie, they've lied about so many countries and so many leaders that I don't believe anything they say. This guy was elected. He got more than 77% of the vote. Meanwhile, Trump got 33% of the vote in his own country. America and the entire Western world has been going steadily um, right-wing, steadily authoritarian over the years, while other countries have been growing steadily more liberal. So yeah, if Trump can make Paul Joseph Watson split away from him and come to his senses, then I kind of have to give him a props for that. But unfortunately, children died. Children died in that strike. And America continues to bomb countries and wonder why do they hate them? Why do? If I was someone in the Middle East, I would hate America's guts. So let's just watch the video Paul Joseph Watson made. It's not World War Three over Syria. Well, half of you are going to absolutely hate me, whatever I say. So here goes. But for a start, I saw this coming. A month ago, I tweeted this. If there's one area Trump will fuck up, it will be in foreign policy. Half of his advisors are CFR globalists. That swamp was not drained. So here's a list of people and entities who support Trump's airstrike on Syria. Hillary Clinton, Chuck Schumer, Lindsey Graham, John McCain, Nancy Pelosi, Angela Merkel, the mainstream media. They are beautiful pictures. Neocons and ISIS. You have to admit that's not great company to keep. And you can argue, as people have, that this is 4D chess, that Trump is engaging in a show of strength to humiliate Obama over his red line and dismantle claims that he's conspiring with the Russians. But those same Russia obsessive people are now attacking Trump because he gave Putin an hour's advance warning. You're never gonna please these people, so why pander to them? But beyond the theories, here's the reality. That airbase that Trump just bombed was protecting a nearby Christian town from being overrun by jihadists. The predominantly Christian city of Marde in northern Hamar has been under attack by rebels every day. Crippling the Syrian army in that region has now made it all but inevitable that that town will be overrun and occupied by jihadist rebels. The airstrike directly helped jihadist rebels and put Christians at risk. Now to be clear, the chemical weapons attack was infinitely worse than Trump's airstrike in terms of human tragedy. This was a horrific event. Children died. And we're not disregarding the scale of the horror by questioning who was responsible. Killing children is dreadful, but no one seemed to care when children were killed during a US military raid in Yemen. But we've just been told to swallow the Assad did it explanation, provided by the White Helmets, an organization many have accused of having direct ties with the rebels, with no impartial investigation whatsoever, despite the fact that we know rebels possess chemical weapons and we know they were almost certainly behind the 2013 chemical weapons attack in Ghouta, despite the fact that Assad and Syria supposedly gave up their chemical weapons. And why would Assad launch a completely self-defeating chemical weapons attack less than a week 
after Rex Tillerson had said that regime change was no longer on the agenda. I think the, the status and the longer term, longer term status of, pre of President Assad will be decided by the Syrian people. Why would Assad infuriate the world by gassing women and children when ISIS are on the run and on the verge of being defeated? It makes absolutely no sense. But now T-Rex says that regime change is back on the table. The process by which Assad would leave is something that I think requires an international community effort, uh, both to first defeat ISIS within Syria to stabilize the Syrian uh, country, to avoid further civil war, and then to work collectively with our partners around the world through a political process that would lead to Assad leaving. So will you and President Trump organize an international coalition to remove Assad? Those steps are underway. Okay, so defeat ISIS and then topple Assad, so that ISIS can then come back and take over the country. Great idea! Here's what can't be denied. Destabilizing secular regimes in the Middle East, whatever the reason given, has always proven disastrous. Iraq, Libya, Syria. It led to hundreds of thousands of dead and displaced people. Dead US troops, more global terrorism, a refugee crisis, the rise of ISIS. And those of you who think this is a one-off limited strike are being incredibly naive. Tillerson said it's about regime change, and given what happened last night, you can bet they're gonna follow through on their word. Regime change means more death, more chaos, a vacuum filled by jihadists, more terrorism, more refugees. We've been down this road before. This is what Trump said in 2013. Don't attack Syria, an attack that will bring nothing but trouble for the US focus on making our country strong and great again. So what happened to that? When did it stop being about America first? Crooked Hillary Clinton's foreign interventions unleashed ISIS in Syria, Iraq, and Libya. She is reckless and dangerous. And this intervention helps ISIS. It helps the jihadist rebels. It helps Al-Qaeda. They're all out celebrating it. Hillary Clinton called for it in the first place. Look, this is what Trump campaigned against. This is one of the main reasons why you voted for him, to stop the US becoming entangled in Middle Eastern quagmires. And I know there's a huge portion of you out there who will completely disagree with me and who will support Trump whatever he does. But I think there's a real chance that Trump has been surrounded and manipulated by neocons and the deep state. I mean, just look at his foreign policy advisors. Half of them, at least half of them, are Council on Foreign Relations members. They're globalists. But even so, I still think there's time to reach out to Trump and let him know that he's following a disastrous course. If Trump vehemently indicates that he won't bow to pressure to impose no-fly zones and initiate regime change, then that will be a positive development. So let's keep the dialogue open. Let's not jump down each other's throats. And let's try to avoid another catastrophe in the Middle East. <laughs>
is through the United Nations. Señora Presidenta, muchas gracias por Madam la palabra. President, thank you for giving me the floor and also for having convening this open meeting of the Security Council. It's vital that not only the members of our organization, but also the whole world should see that the positions of the members of the Security Council in a totally transparent way, given what has taken over recent days in Syria. Bolivia ha solicitado Bolivia la convocatoria de esta reunión eh, preocupada eh, por los sucesos que se han registrado en las últimas horas. Mientras el Consejo de Seguridad debatía propuestas sobre cuál iba a ser el mecanismo de investigación de los horribles ataques con armas químicas de los que ha sido eh, testigo la humanidad. Mientras discutíamos las palabras que se iban a utilizar en una resolución que debía ser tratada en resolución, mientras los miembros permanentes y los miembros no permanentes planteábamos propuestas Put forward para el texto de esa resolución, Estados Unidos preparaba a su vez un, y ejecutaba un ataque unilateral. Los ataques con misiles, por supuesto, son una acción unilateral y representan una grave amenaza a la paz y seguridad internacional. ¿Por qué? Porque a lo largo de los últimos 70 años, la humanidad ha construido una estructura no solamente física, no solamente institucional, sino además una estructura legal. Ha construido instrumentos de derecho internacional para evitar justamente que los más poderosos ataquen con impunidad a los más débiles, para garantizar un equilibrio en el mundo y evitar, por supuesto, que hayan to avoid gravísimas violaciones serious violations la of international peace and security. Creemos que es deber de este Consejo, We believe it to no be the duty Consejo, of this Security Council, but not just of the Security Council, of the United Nations organizations in all its bodies to defend multilateralism. We are here to defend multilateralism. We have agreed that this Charter, the United respetada. Nations Charter, must be respected. Y esta carta prohíbe las acciones unilaterales. Toda acción debe ser autorizada por el, por el Consejo de Seguridad de acuerdo a la Carta de las Naciones Unidas. Me voy a permitir leer un par de, de artículos para que todos podamos refrescar un poco la memoria. El artículo 24 de esta carta dice lo siguiente. A fin de asegurar la acción rápida y eficaz por parte de las Naciones Unidas, sus miembros confieren al Consejo de Seguridad la responsabilidad primordial de mantener la paz y la seguridad internacional y reconocen que el Consejo de Seguridad actúa a nombre de ellos al desempeñar las funciones que le imponen aquella responsabilidad. Este Consejo no son solamente los 15 miembros que estamos sentados en esta mesa. Nosotros representamos a los 193 estados de esta organización y a través de ellos a los pueblos del mundo y hemos acordado que las acciones unilaterales violan el derecho internacional. Mientras ayer discutíamos we los proyectos de resolución, mientras nos esforzábamos para plantear alternativas y llegar a un consenso y mostrar unidad en el Consejo de Seguridad, Estados Unidos Council, no solamente ataca unilateralmente, unilater sino que cuando todos estábamos aquí discutiendo y exigiendo la necesidad de una investigación independiente, imparcial, completa y concluyente de esos ataques, Estados Unidos se convierte en el investigador, se convierte en el fiscal, se convierte en el juez y se convierte en el The judge has become the jury. ¿Dónde está la investigación so, que permite determinar objetivamente quién es el responsable de esos ataques? Who is responsible for Esa the es una violación gravísima, This is a extremely, gravísima al derecho internacional. No es la primera vez que sucede esto. 
a lo largo de la historia. Throughout history, recordar muchos episodios en los que varias potencias, no solo Estados Unidos, no solo los Estados Unidos, han actuado unilateralmente violando la Carta de los Estados Pero el hecho de que pase una vez más no significa que las naciones unidas no mean that the United Nations and its members must accept it. En septiembre del año 2013, Estados Unidos también amenazó con iniciar ataques en contra de Siria. Y yo recuerdo lo que dijo el entonces secretario general Ban Ki-moon en esa Y permítame leer la cita en inglés de lo que dijo el secretario general. Abro comillas. The Security Council has primary responsibility for international peace and security. That's my appeal, that everything should be handled within the framework of the United Nations Charter. The use of force is lawful only when in exercise of self-defense in accordance with Article 51 of the United Nations Charter and or when Security Council approves such action. Cierro comillas. End of quote. Fue la posición de la secretaría, del secretario general en ese entonces, que contribuyó a evitar una acción unilateral en situaciones muy parecidas a las que estamos viviendo ahora. Este ataque representa una amenaza a la paz y seguridad internacionales porque representa una amenaza a los procesos políticos de Ginebra y Astana. Lo dijo muy bien el señor uh, Feldman en el mensaje well del secretario, secretario general, general que es imprescindible evitar que haya un escalamiento de las tensiones que rompan lo avanzado, aunque haya sido muy poco, tanto en Astana como en Ginebra. Y decía, es la primera vez que sucede esto. Quiero recordar lo que pasó en este mismo consejo hace algunos años. Just a few years ago, el miércoles 5 de febrero del año 2003, the 5th of February, cuando el entonces secretario de Estado de los Estados Unidos venía Secretary a esta sala United a presentarnos, room, según sus propias palabras, pruebas words, contundentes de que existían armas de destrucción masiva Iraq. en Irak. Y yo creo que es imprescindible I que... Believe que recordemos esas imágenes, que recordemos que en esta misma sala se nos dijo que habían armas de destrucción masiva en Irak y que eso motivó una invasión. Y esa invasión, después de esa invasión, se han registrado un millón de muertos y se ha desatado una serie de atrocidades en la región. Podríamos hablar de ISIS sin esa invasión? ¿Podríamos hablar de esa, de esa serie de gravísimos y horrendos ataques en distintos lugares del mundo sin esa invasión ilegal? Creo que es imprescindible que recordemos lo que la historia nos enseña. En esa oportunidad, Estados Unidos afirmaba con contundencia que tenía todas las pruebas para demostrar que Irak tenía armas de destrucción masiva. Nunca se encontraron. Nunca se encontraron. Quiero reiterar lo que dijo el presidente Evo Morales hoy en la mañana. Y abro comillas, and I quote, pienso y siento, I believe no and I feel, I hope I'm not mistaken, las armas that chemical weapons in Syria are just an excuse for a military intervention. Las acciones unilaterales son acciones imperiales. A Estados Unidos no le interesa el derecho internacional. Deja de lado a la ONU cuando le conviene. Los problemas internos de los países se deben resolver con diálogo, no con bombardeo. Esta acción amenaza la seguridad internacional y la paz mundial. Cierro comillas. Es importante hablar de del doble estándar en el, en el, eh, cuando se está en los salones de Naciones Unidas y cuando se actúa en lo que puede ser considerado la vida real. Y mis pueblos, los pueblos latinoamericanos y caribeños han sufrido a lo largo de, de, de la historia esta realidad. Nos hablan del discurso de los derechos humanos que nosotros cumplimos 
pero cuando el discurso de los derechos humanos no les alcanza para sus intereses, violan sistemáticamente los derechos humanos. La serie de golpes de Estado en América Latina han sido organizados, financiados por la CIA. Es una verdad histórica, no es retórica, no es un discurso, es una verdad. Recordemos el golpe de Estado en 1973 en contra del gobierno constitucional de Salvador Allende, financiado por la CIA. Recordemos la Escuela de las Américas en la que se enseñaba a los soldados a torturar. Había manuales de tortura y eso se enseñaba a los militares latinoamericanos en la denominada Doctrina de Seguridad Nacional. Cuando interesa el discurso de derechos humanos está bien, pero cuando ya no cumple con sus intereses ya no importa. Lo mismo pasa con la democracia. Cuando conviene a sus intereses, defensores de la democracia. Pero cuando no, financian golpes de Estado. Y lo mismo pasa que cuando ya no cumple con sus intereses, it's not in line with their interests, then multilateralism is not Para important anymore. Para algunas cosas que les conviene, está bien el multilateralismo. When it suits them, multilateralism is fine. Están bien las Naciones Unidas. The United Nations is fine. Pero cuando no, cuando sus intereses se contraponen, entonces no, no interesan ni las Naciones Unidas, ni los derechos humanos, ni la democracia. Nations or in human rights or in democracy. Decíamos cuando condenábamos de manera inequívoca los ataques químicos. When we condemn unequivocally chemical attacks. Que el Consejo de Seguridad no debe ser usado como una caja de resonancia de la propaganda de guerra ni del intervencionismo. Que el Consejo de Seguridad no debe ser usado como un peón a sacrificar en un tablero de ajedrez, en el tablero de ajedrez de la guerra. Este Consejo, estas Naciones Unidas son al final la última esperanza que tenemos para garantizar la paz y la seguridad internacional basadas en principios, basadas en normas, basadas en un Estado de Derecho Internacional. Señora Presidenta, asimismo me permito... Señalar que es imprescindible hacerlo así como usted ha convocado de esta reunión de manera muy transparente, manifestar la, la preocupación de que lamentablemente existen miembros de primera y miembros de segunda en este Consejo de Seguridad. Miembros permanentes que no solamente tienen el derecho a veto, sino que controlan los procedimientos, que controlan la toma de decisiones. Y los otros diez que estamos eventualmente y que... Se nos consulta o se nos convoca solamente a veces, no para aportar, sino solamente para suscribir ciertas posiciones. Bolivia desea reiterar su enérgica condena, su enérgica condena al uso de armas o el uso de elementos químicos como armas por ser un hecho injustificable y criminal, independientemente de su motivación, donde quiera que sea, cuando sea y por quien quiera que sea cometido. Y reiteramos que exigimos cuando se dé uno de estos casos unas investigaciones independientes, imparciales, completas y concluyentes. Lamentablemente los ataques de ayer le han dado un golpe mortal al GIM, al mecanismo de investigaciones a la OPAC para que puedan llevar adelante una investigación y que sepa con exactitud qué es lo que ha sucedido hace unos días en Irak. Reiteramos que los responsables de esos actos tienen que ser debidamente procesados y sancionados con el mayor rigor de la ley. Lo mismo con las acciones que violan el derecho internacional y ponen en peligro la seguridad. Internacional. Gracias, Presidente. Gracias, Presidente.